You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is. Jacob Volk. Welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk, and I have to start with the game of the week. The game that everyone was looking forward to. The game that people went out of their way to watch. And you can include me in that group. That is Buccaneer Saints. That was by far and away the most appealing game on the schedule yesterday. Yes, it was more important than the Islander game. Yes, it was more important than Clippers Nuggets. I have to start with football. Alright, football is back. Everyone's excited. The NFL seems to have gotten off to a good start from a coronavirus perspective. So, it seems like we're on the right track to get a season done. But on to Buccaneers Saints. And it's amazing. How this game unfolded. You have two of the best quarterbacks in NFL history going at it. Everyone expected this game to be a shootout. And I understand the final score was 34-23 Saints. All right, it did hit the over, so you made money there. But the Buccaneers really disappointed in this game. Tom Brady did not look like the Brady of old. He made a lot of mistakes. He threw two really bad interceptions. Got sacked three times. I understand he was victimized by some penalties, which is something that he's not used to. Playing for Belichick, you're not going to commit a lot of penalties. If you do, you're off the team. So that was a hurdle that Brady had to overcome, and he didn't. But what surprised me more than anything was how uncomfortable he looked. You take a look at the Buccaneers. They spent all this time hyping up the fact that they made the big trade for Gronkowski, and obviously they still have Mike Evans. You pair those two guys with Chris Godwin, and the greatest player in NFL history. You have an explosive offense, right? Well, evidently not. Chris Godwin got his six catches for 79 yards. Good for him. Gronkowski and Evans combined for just three catches for 13 yards. Mike Evans only caught one pass. And it was when the game was over. It made the score 34 to 23. No one expected the Buccaneers to come back at that point. So Evans finally catches a two-yard pass from the GOAT. whoop de freaking do I understand that this is a new offense. And the Buccaneers didn't have the benefit of a traditional training camp and a preseason to 
get them going. But when you watch the Patriots win yesterday, they make Ryan Fitzpatrick look terrible. And you watch Cam Newton put together a vintage Cam Newton performance. Isn't that a little concerning to you? As a Buccaneers fan, isn't there a little bit of you that's concerned? I understand that you probably don't care how the Patriots did. All right, they play in a completely different conference. Their win yesterday doesn't affect you, but realize you have Tom Brady as your quarterback. There is going to be that inevitable intertwining that people make. The Patriots played great. Why didn't the Buccaneers? I will say this. The first salvo in the Belichick is responsible for Brady's success versus... Brady is responsible for Belichick's success battle, which is probably going to be decided this year and the year after. It goes to Belichick. And it's not even close. Now, having said that, I do agree with Jeff Benedict, who said last week that The sample size is too small. These guys spent two decades together, and we're only going to get two years of them apart. You know, there are going to be a lot of people that read into this year and next year as who's really better, but Jeff is right that it's not a perfect comparison. I do think it means something, but in a perfect world, we wouldn't be doing it this way. We'd have Brady apart from Belichick for more years. We'd have Brady apart from Belichick before Brady turned 43. It's not a perfect comparison. But it's the best we have. And when you see the Patriots play well and Brady drastically underachieved, doesn't that worry you a little bit if you're a Buccaneers fan? I understand that it's week one. And we shouldn't read too much into this, but it's not the most comforting thing in the world. To see this highly promoted Buccaneers offense underachieve. I mean, it should scare you that Scotty Miller got more targets than Mike Evans. I understand that Miller was a sexy guy in fantasy football. But did anyone really think he'd get five catches for 73 yards in week one? Who the hell had heard of this guy? For real, could you pick Scotty Miller out of a lineup? Why was he getting those targets and not Mike Evans? You want to tell me that the Saints have a great secondary and you were trying to get your other wide receivers involved? Okay, I get that, but then why did Chris Godwin get seven targets? Again, it's week one. I don't want to make too big a deal out of it. But this doesn't inspire a lot of confidence in me. If I was a Buccaneers fan, I'd be a little nervous right now. And when you look at this from the Saints side of things... Drew Brees really underwhelmed. He threw for just 160 yards. I understand he threw two touchdowns. He didn't turn the ball over. The Jared Cook connection looked really good, which killed me in fantasy football 
Because the guy who I was going up against had Cook and Breeze. I was looking really good after the pick six by Brady. I was up by like 20. And I had a decent chance of winning. Like the best chance of winning I had all day yesterday. It seems like I'm going to lose this week. It's still possible I can win, but... I'm not overly confident. Friggin' Baker Mayfield killed me. Again, it's one game and he's going up against a great defense, but... Gee whiz. Six points? Brown spent all this time... to build up the offensive line and that's what they end up with? That lousy protection for Mayfield? They better get their head screwed on straight, or else they're in trouble. But back to the Saints, I understand this probably isn't what you want to see from the offense right away. Breeze not looking great. The running game looking terrible. Latavius Murray was your leading rusher. Already had 15 carries for 48 yards. 48 yards isn't good. Let's get that out there. But he had more rushes and more yards than Alvin Kamara. Kamara had 12 rushes for 16 yards. Now he got involved in the passing game, but how does Latavius Murray get more carries than Alvin Kamara? What is going on with these teams? This is like the Twilight Zone. The Buccaneers offense should be great. Not that good. Alvin Kamara should be the bell cow back for the Saints. He gets outrushed by Latavius Murray. The Browns have a new and improved offense. They only score six points. You watch. The Chicago Bears are going to win the Super Bowl. Mitchell Trubisky is going to be Super Bowl MVP. <laughs> So all in all, this isn't the game that was advertised. It was really exciting to see Brady in a new uniform. And I don't want to read too much into week one. The Saints got the win. That's really all that matters. But for the Buccaneers, it is a little concerning. You have all the talent in the world, and you underachieve. Not a good look for Brady. I am going to preview the two Monday night games. The first one is Steelers-Giants, and I'm looking forward to this game. I want to see how Roethlisberger comes back from his injury. I want to see how a guy like Juju Smith-Schuster benefits from getting his quarterback back. Smith-Schuster did not have a good year last year. He missed four games with injury. And when he was on the field, he underachieved. Now, part of that is because Mason Rudolph and Devlin Hodges were starting. And those guys had more familiarity with the backups. So guys like James Washington are going to get more targets than a Smith-Schuster because the quarterback has more familiarity with Washington. But the Steelers really do need to get that connection going early. Smith-Schuster is one of the best wide receivers in football. The Giants do not have a good secondary. They don't have Sam Beal. They don't have DeAndre Baker. They're going to roll out James Bradbury, Corey Ballantyne, Logan Ryan... And Isaac Yeadam. I think I mispronounced his last name. But you get the point I'm making. Logan Ryan's really good. But he's not going to be matched up with Smith-Schuster too much. 
At least he shouldn't be. He's a nickel corner. He'll probably be matched up against Deontay Johnson or James Washington. So you're going to see a guy like Bradbury locked in on Smith-Schuster all game. Edge Steelers. I'm not a big Bradbury fan. I thought he was being massively overrated in March. I said as much before he signed with the Giants. I thought he got massively overpaid. Roethlisberger should have a field day targeting Smith-Schuster on Bradbury. If I was the Steelers, I would try to get a lot of one-on-one battles there. Roethlisberger lobs it up to Smith-Schuster, and he just lets him make a play on the ball. And Eric Ebron, too, I think is going to be a big factor. The Giants do not have good linebackers. It's going to be really tough for them to contain Ebron. I think he's going to get a lot of red zone targets. He may vulture some touchdowns away from Smith-Schuster for fantasy purposes, but hey, if Smith-Schuster is getting a bunch of catches for a bunch of yards, I can't get too upset. Look for the Steelers to get Smith-Schuster and Ebron and Vance McDonald, because he's not bad, involved a lot. As for the Giants, I'm really, I don't want to say excited to see what Daniel Jones can do his second year, his first full year starting, but it is going to be interesting to watch. I will say this, though, Andrew Thomas is going to have his work cut out for him Going up against Cameron Hayward. That's a tough assignment for your first matchup in the NFL. You're going up against Cameron Hayward. I don't envy Thomas at all. Saquon Barkley will obviously get his... I love watching Barkley play. I really do. He's one of my favorite players in the NFL to watch. He can just do things that normal human beings can't. But all in all, I do think the Steelers are going to win this game. And hopefully Sterling Shepard lays an egg. Because my opponent this week in fantasy football has Shepard starting. Moving on now to Titans Broncos. And... That same opponent of mine in fantasy football has Derrick Henry starting. Man alive. If I'm going to pull out a comeback, I need a lot of things to go right. The one thing I'll say is, as great as Derrick Henry is, and he is great, make no mistake about it. He's going up against a really good Broncos defense. Even with Von Miller out, they still have Bradley Chubb. They have a good defensive line. Henry will get his, but I don't think he's going to have a fantastic game like he did in the playoffs last year. I'm also going to be interested to see how... Ryan Tannehill does against this Broncos secondary. They made the trade for A.J. Bouye. They still have Bryce Callahan, Justin Simmons, and Kareem Jackson. The Titans do have a lot of weapons. A.J. Brown, Corey Davis, who is questionable, and Adam Humphreys along with Jonu Smith at tight end. So it's going to be very interesting to see how Tannehill divvies up those targets. Also, let's see if Tannehill can duplicate his really good year this year. That'll be the real test for him. It's great that he went off in the little bit of time that he started, but he has to do it again. As for the Broncos... I'm looking forward to watching this offense. 
even though Cortland Sutton isn't going to be at 100%, it's possible he can play. He is questionable. He's going to get his. Him and Drew Locke had a really good connection last year. And the Broncos added a lot of talent for Locke to work with. They drafted Jerry Judy. They drafted K.J. Hamler. They still have Noah Fant. They signed Melvin Gordon. Locke is going to have a field day with this offense. I like Locke a lot. He's going to have his work cut out for him going up against Clowney and Malcolm Butler. And guys like that, Mike Vrabel has done a fantastic job with this defense. But I think Locke is going to have a good game. Having said that, though, I like the Titans to win. Sutton not being at 100% does scare me. And the Titans have a lot of weapons on offense. I think the Titans have this. Alright, now it's time to talk about the NBA. And I'll start by talking about Game 7 of the Celtics-Raptors series. I know that happened on Friday, but I didn't talk about it yet, so... Let me do it now. This was a fantastic game. And really, a fantastic series. Did this series have some stinkers? Yeah, games 1 and 5 weren't the most exciting games in the world. But every other game was a single-digit game. Both teams pulled out all the stops defensively. Both teams shot 41% from the field, which isn't terrible, but isn't great. But when you look at three-pointers, that's where you can really see the difference that these defenses made. Both teams shot under 30% from beyond the arc. The Celtics shot 24%. The Raptors shot 29%. Jalen Brown, Kemba Walker, and Marcus Smart did not have good shooting games. Neither did Kyle Lowry. But the reason the Celtics won this game was because of their active hands. The Raptors got sloppy with the basketball, and the Celtics have really good defenders that can make you pay. Jalen Brown had four steals. Marcus Smart had three. Even Kemba Walker got in on the action. He had two. If you're going to be sloppy with the basketball, don't do it against a great defensive team like this. The Raptors only had one steal in this game, made by Marcus Saul. The Celtics had 12. I mean, the Celtics did try kind of hard to lose this game. They got to the free throw line 23 times. They only hit 13 of their free throws. But ultimately, this game came down to turnovers. The Raptors were sloppy with the basketball. I'll say that again. And the Celtics made them pay. The Raptors only had 18 points off turnovers. The Celtics had 31 Not the most exciting win for the Celtics, but I'll take it if I was a fan of theirs. As for the Raptors, they don't have much to be upset about here. They lose one of the best players in the NBA in Kawhi Leonard. And they still took a really good Celtics team to seven games, came very close to winning. I understand it's a tough pill to swallow. You were the NBA champions last year, and now you're out in the second round. But realize, you did all this without Kawhi Leonard. 
I'd expect Masai Ujiri to try to make another big splash. Their window to win is now. And I expect them to seize it. Moving on now to Rockets Lakers. And this game was kind of surprising to me. The Lakers didn't go inside as much as they did in the previous games. But you know what? They didn't need to. They shot the lights out. 53% from the field and 51% from beyond the arc. They had six players score in the double digits. Anthony Davis, LeBron James, Markeith Morris, KCP, Danny Green, and my boy Kyle Kuzma. They didn't even need a vintage uh, Rajon Rondo performance. Before this series started, I'm pretty sure I picked Lakers in five. I definitely picked the Lakers to win. I don't think that was a bold pick, but I'm pretty sure I got the number of games right. So, good job, Jacob. But this does bring up an interesting issue for the Rockets. Where do they go from here? They put all their eggs in the small ball basket. It didn't work. They made the big trade for Russell Westbrook. I don't think you can win with Westbrook. I don't think you can have Russell Westbrook on your team in any capacity and be successful in the playoffs. This guy is not a clutch player. All right? Great regular season performer, future Hall of Famer. But in an elimination game, when you're the second best player on the team, you cannot shoot just 4 for 13 from the field And only drop 10 points. The Rockets need to reinvent this team very quickly. They started by letting Mike D'Antoni walk. And it's going to be very interesting to see where he goes. I know I called for the Sixers to hire Darvin Ham. But he'd make a lot of sense for them. I think he could find a way to make that Sixers roster click. He is an offensive genius. His teams just don't play defense. But when you have Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid, and Matisse Thibel on the team, those guys are going to play defense. Mike D'Antoni would make perfect sense there. But I think the Rockets' issues go further than D'Antoni. I think Daryl Morey needs to be held accountable. He's the guy who ultimately traded Capella. He left his team vulnerable for this type of a matchup. I think he needs to be held accountable for that. The Rockets need a major reload. If they're going to win with James Harden... And realize, Harden isn't going to get much better. Alright, the guy's one of the best players in the NBA, but he's 31 years old. You have to win with him sooner rather than later. We can talk about how terrible the decision was for the Thunder to trade him, but at the end of the day, if he doesn't win anything, it's not that terrible. The Rockets need a major overhaul. Rebuild the whole team around Harden. Find a sucker to take on Russell Westbrook. I don't want him. I'll tell you this right now. If Daryl Morey or whoever is going to take over the Rockets, because I think Morey should be fired, calls Sean Marks and offers Russell Westbrook, no, 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 no. You keep him. I don't want him. And that has nothing to do with the fact that the Nets have Kevin Durant. That's just... I don't think you can win with Russell Westbrook. So find someone to take him on. The Knicks, maybe? 
They want to make a splash for some stupid reason. Rebuild this whole team. And hire Ty Lu as your head coach. I think that's the right hire. And someone else as your GM, please. Someone who's not as heavily into the analytics. Alright, I think we've seen that that doesn't work. Alright, that's going to do it for basketball. I'm going to move right into hockey. I'll talk about Heat Celtics and Nuggets Clippers tomorrow. I just wanted to break down the concluded series that I didn't get a chance to put a bow on. But now it's time to talk about the Islanders series. And I'm upset. Not as upset as I was Wednesday night, but still, I'm upset. You know, they roped me back in on Friday night with a really good win. They got to Vasilevsky, they scored four goals against him. That asinine turnover late that allowed Brock Nelson to score. Great pass by Anthony Beauvillier. You know, they roped me back in for yesterday. If the Islanders would have lost that game on Friday, I'd have gone right up here to start recording the Jets' Week 1 recap. That's why you got it when you got it. I watched the Islanders game. Then, I recorded. Because the Islanders made it a series on Patriot Day. But then yesterday, you really can't play much worse. They got outplayed in every sense of the word. They got outshot in every period. They lost a bunch of their face-offs. Their power play was non-existent. Big surprise. Their penalty kill was good. All right, I'll give them credit there. But at the end of the first period yesterday, I had a bad feeling about this game. Because the Islanders got grossly outplayed. They only managed five shots. In the first period. Then the second period comes. And Brock Nelson puts the Islanders up on top. Then 15 seconds later. Yanni Gord. Makes. One of the best passes. You'll ever see to Blake Coleman. And the Lightning tie the game up. Somehow, the Islanders were able to come up with something even worse than that. Because 12 seconds later, Andre Palat scored. So as soon as the Islanders scored, alright, 27 seconds after that, it's 2-1 Lightning. It was like a boxing combination. You get hit with a quick left jab, and then a big right hook. It sent you to the mat. The Islanders weren't coming back after that. You had to know that. The point goal after that was just the icing on the cake. The Islanders didn't deserve to win this game. Matthew Barzell was dreadful. Ryan Pulock was dreadful. Devon Taves was dreadful. The whole team was dreadful. Outside of Nelson and Bailey. I mean, this series is over. Alright, forget about it. This team isn't going to win three straight against this Lightning team. This is a great Lightning team. It's cooking on all cylinders. I don't care who they go up against. The Stars or the Golden Knights. The Lightning are winning the Stanley Cup. And I'll be really happy for John Cooper. I like Cooper. Smart guy. Went to Hofstra. I've been in the same room as him. Speaking of Stars Golden Knights, it's really time to start putting some respect on Anton Kudobin's name. And I don't have a problem saying that. 
because Kudobin is a million times better than Kemper, and he's a million times better than Halak. What Kudobin has done in three of his last four games is incredible. He's only given up four goals in the Stars' wins this series. He has made this Vegas team look dreadful offensively. Guys like Max Pacioretty and Mark Stone and Riley Smith and Jonathan Marchessault, William Carlson, Shea Theodore, Paul Stastny, Nate Schmidt, whoever you want to say, they can't get anything going. Alright, fine. Game two, he looked human. You know what? I'll take it. Get your one bad game out of your system and then play great. Now, I don't know if I would want to build a team around Kudobin. This may be a case of just riding the hot hand, which I don't mind. But make no mistake about it. If we gave out an MVP for the Western Conference Finals, Kudobin would get it. He's been that incredible... The Stars are going to win this series. I'm going to go 0 for 2 in my NHL Conference Finals picks. I don't feel confident in making a pick tonight. But I can say this. I think it's going to be a Lightning Stars Stanley Cup Final. I know that's not a bold thing to say or anything, but it's the truth. There is some off-the-gridiron news to talk about. Namely, a bunch of extensions that broke over the weekend. I can't remember too many extensions breaking that close to opening day. But regardless, I'm going to talk about him, and I'll start with the Vikings locking up Dalvin Cook for five years at $63 million. That puts him in the top six for running backs in terms of AAV and total value. Cook had a great year last year. He rushed for over 1,100 yards, and he had 13 touchdowns. And he got off to a great start yesterday. Had 12 carries for 50 yards and two touchdowns. But this guy really only has the one great year. I understand that this was going to be the last year you had him and then he was going to hit free agency. But we know how free agency treats running backs. It's not a great market. Unless you have a stupid GM like Mike McCagnin who's going to overpay for someone like Le'Veon Bell. Then you're getting a bunch of money. But I think people have learned their lesson that you don't need to go crazy for running backs. I'm not saying they're not important, but you can get quality running back play and not break the bank. Melvin Gordon did not get a crazy deal in free agency this year. This is an overpay. I know why the Vikings did it. I don't despise it. But I don't particularly like it. On a scale of 1 to 10, I would give this a 4.5. Moving on now to another running back extension. Alvin Kamara's with the Saints. They gave him five years and $75 million. That puts him in the top two for running backs in terms of AAV and total value. I like this move for the Saints. This makes sense. Kamara has 
firmly established himself as one of the best running backs in the NFL. When you look at his rushing stats, they're not that impressive. But you have to look at his catches. He has had over 1,300 all-purpose yards every year he's been in the NFL. Did he have a bad game yesterday? No question. All right, there's no excuse to only get 1.3 yards per attempt. And to have Latavius Murray look that much better than you. But he still got his in the passing game. That's the thing with a guy like Kamara. If he's not producing on the ground, he can produce through the air. That's what the great players do. They find a way to contribute. Kamara is great. I like this move. It makes a lot more sense than the Cook extension. Great move for the Saints. Supposedly, Todd Bowles wanted to take him when he was Jets head coach. But Mike McCagnan didn't listen to him. Oh, what could have been. Moving on now to the Rams locking up Cooper Cup to a three-year extension worth $48 million. And I really like this move. Cup is one of the more underrated players in the NFL. He burst on the scene his rookie year. Him and Jared Goff had an instant connection. Last year, he had his first 1,000-yard season. He caught 94 passes. Him and Robert Woods are a lethal 1-2 combination. One of the best ones in all of football, and it doesn't get talked about. I mean, you saw it yesterday. The Cowboys were on their heels for a lot of that game. And Cup got his. Four catches for 40 yards. That's pretty good. The contract compensates him fairly. He's now in the top 15 in terms of highest paid wide receivers. Really good move for the Rams. It makes a ton of sense. The last extension to talk about concerns the Saints locking up Demario Davis for three years at 27 mil. And this is a fantastic move. Pro Football Focus wasn't as kind to Davis when he was a Jet as they should have been. As someone who watched every game of his, I can tell you, he was a really good player for him. The Jets let him go, he went to the Saints, and he took his game to a completely different level. He was the Saints' best player defensively last year, according to Pro Football Focus. He had a 90.1 overall grade. When you look at inside linebackers, he was only behind Eric Kendricks. This contract doesn't even put him in the top 10 highest paid linebackers in the NFL. I don't know how the Saints talked him into this. This is a steal. This is a fantastic move. Great, great, great job by the Saints in locking up him and Kamara. I do want to talk a little bit about college football because there was a major, major upset on Saturday. And that was the Raging Cajuns stunning Iowa State by a score of 31 to 14. I mean, make no mistake about it, this is a big upset. The week one games are always cupcake games. You should never lose those. I mean, I understand this year is different, and you saw conference games right away, but not ISU. They were going up against a Sun Belt team. And that Sunbelt team killed them. Louisiana Lafayette had two special teams touchdowns. 
a 95-yard kick return, and an 83-yard punt return. They also had a 78-yard touchdown pass. Now, Levi Lewis didn't throw that 78 yards. His wide receiver, Peter LeBlanc, did a lot of the work, but still, you can't give up three home run plays and expect to win. Brock Purdy did not have a good game. He completed less than 50% of his passes, threw for less than 150 yards, no touchdowns, and an interception. Their running back, Brees Hall, had a good game, 20 carries uh, for 103 yards and a touchdown. He did lose a fumble, but not the end of the world. The big key for ISU in this game was the absence of their tight end, Charlie Kohler. Kohler was a big part of their offense last year. He caught 51 passes and 7 touchdowns. He caught more touchdowns last year than any Cyclone did. To not play with him was a big loss for Purdy. Now, having said that, there's no excuse to lose this game. This was a really, really bad week for the Big 12. A lot of their teams went up against Sunbelt teams. They had three losses. Louisiana Lafayette beat ISU. Arkansas State beat Kansas State 35-31. And Coastal Carolina beat Kansas 38-23. You can't lose those games. I understand that Kansas State and Kansas aren't football powerhouses. But when you're a Big 12 school and you're going up against Sunbelt teams, you have to win those games. Maybe the Big 12 should have had all their teams play in the spring. They would have avoided this embarrassment. There is some hockey news to talk about that happened off the ice. Nothing earth-shattering or anything, but still worth talking about. The first of those stories concerns the Kings locking up Sean Walker for four years at 10.6 mil. That's a 2.65 mil AAV. Walker had a really good year last year, 24 points in 70 games. I understand that he was a minus 12, and he's a minus 20 in his career. That's not good for a defenseman, but he's playing with the Kings. Alright, these aren't the Stanley Cup winning Kings. These are bad Kings teams. Walker was, without question, their second-best defenseman last year behind Drew Doughty. They had to lock him up. The AAV may be a little steep for my blood, but it's not the end of the world. I know why the Kings did it. They got a good young defenseman. Under control for a long time. I like this move. Moving on now to the Hurricanes trading Joel Edmondson's rights to the Canadians for their fifth rounder this year. And this move makes a ton of sense for both sides. The Hurricanes still have a full defense. With Dougie Hamilton, Jacob Slavin, Brady Shea, Jake Gardner, Brett Pesci, and Hayden Flurry, Where are you going to play Edmondson? Alright, I understand you may want a 7th defenseman, but Edmondson was going to want a pretty penny. You don't want someone like that as your 7th defenseman. But having said that, Edmondson has earned a big contract. And the fact that the Canadians may give it to him makes sense. 
Carey Price needs a lot of help in front of him. All right, you saw it in the playoffs this year. Price was getting bombarded from all angles. The Canadians really needed to upgrade their defensemen. They're not terribly lost there. They have a solid top four with guys like Shea Weber, Jeff Petrie, Ben Sherratt, and Victor Mete. But Brett Kulak is useless. Carl Olsner has failed miserably. They need a consistent guy to put on that third defensive pair. Edmondson is a perfect fit for that role. He had 20 points last year for the Hurricanes. He'll give them a physical presence. Something that they really don't have outside of Ben Sherratt. This move makes sense for both sides. I'm going to say it's an even trade. The last hockey story to talk about concerns the Flames bringing back Jeff Ward as their head coach. And it makes sense that they would bring him back. I wasn't terribly impressed with the Flames when they played in the playoffs this year, but they had a really good regular season under Ward. They struggled with Bill Peters. I thought they pulled the trigger on that way too early, but you know what? Ward got him cooking. Peters was 12-12-4 this year. Ward was 24, 15, and 3. I can't argue with results. I don't love this move. There were better options out there, but I understand why the Flames would want some consistency for their young core of Kachuk, Goudreau, Lindholm, Monaghan... Mangiapane, etc., etc. The move makes sense. I'm not crazy about it. Again, there were better options available, but I understand wanting to keep a guy around who had the team playing well in the regular season and won a playoff series this year. They did beat the Jets. New York Yankees show tonight. Regular episode of the Jacob Volk Show coming your way tomorrow afternoon and every weekday afternoon. After that, you know the drill. Until next time, I am Jacob Volk saying that when Charlie Finley had his heart operation... It took eight hours. Seven of those were spent just trying to find his heart.